So welcome to the September Frictionist School, everyone. Um, sorry for the little glitch. Um, so I put together a presentation of the stuff that I wanted to discuss with all of you today. Um, so most of it is also in the meeting notes. Um, but um, again, this is just a reminder about all the stuff that we need to discuss. So whenever you feel like you want to add something or you have a question, please just interrupt me and go ahead um, unmuting yourself. So the thing that we wanted to discuss as the first item was the frictionless Python framework, which is basically one of the software implementations that we have um, of the frictionless data package. So uh, until now, the Python framework was kind of like governed by Open Knowledge Foundation, um, and its development was mostly done, um, and the roadmap was mostly done by us, with, uh, of course, contributors from the community as well. Um, so since now a few months, uh, we have been thinking about basically expanding a little bit the governance um, of the framework. And um, what we want to do is to bring in new people basically to help us out, to have more eyes on the code base, but also to ensure a broader sustainability of the project uh, so that it's not all in, let's say, OKFN's okay hand. Um, so at the moment, we're looking for maintainers or active contributors for the Python uh, for the Python framework. And of course, Open Knowledge Foundation is still going to contribute with a tech lead, who's Patricio Del Boca, who's not here today because he's on holiday, uh, but he will attend, and he attended some of the calls in the past, so some of you may know him already. Uh, there's going to be a committee manager from Open Knowledge Foundation, so myself and Evgeny, who's also here, um, will also be involved in the project, but um, maybe a bit less on the Python framework in the future. So I'm going through this very, very fast because basically what uh, I wanted also to share with you is that basically we already have um, someone who kind of like started to uh, be an official maintainer and that's Pierre here. Um, so uh, who's part of Multicop and Pierre, I'll leave you maybe to say a bit more about this. Um, yes, of course. Um, so I'm associate and co-founder of Multi, uh, which is a cooperative company. Uh, we're building software for a public and para-public uh, administration re uh, for researchers and for associations mostly. Uh, and um, our core business is around open data and uh, free software. Um, so uh, it is all natural that we also contribute to some uh, open open source software, uh, and I've been ma maintaining for some time now uh, Validata, which is a, a, actually a, a wrapper around frictionless, uh, which offers uh, API server translations, uh, custom checks uh, for the French administration, and it uh, it is used mostly in the data.gov uh, portal of open data in France. Yeah, we are, we, are, we are based in France, uh, and uh, for for months now, I've been uh, in, involved a, a little bit more in uh, the maintenance of uh, frictionless. Um, I have a couple of hours in the week uh, dedicated to the to to, to frictionless Pi, um, and uh, yeah, let me know if uh, I can I can help with it. Fantastic. Thanks, Pierre. Um, yeah, so basically this call is to let all of you know that we're looking for more peers out there. Um, so um, basically, if you are interested or if, if you know uh, anyone who would be interested in helping us maintaining um, the Python framework, uh, that would be great. As Evgeny just pointed out in the chat, um, it's close to get um, 1,000 stars on GitHub, which is pretty amazing. So that could maybe be uh, also... Um, uh, a way to convince people uh, to join us. Um, the other um, suggestion that was made, uh, I was having a chat with Peter about this um, uh, more or less a month ago, and he uh, suggested me that I get in touch with the PyOpenSci community. So I don't know if you know them already, but they could maybe also jump in and help us uh, maintaining the project. So... All in all, this is like the news about the Python framework. Uh, and so the way that we will do that, so we'll put a banner on GitHub also announcing that we're looking for maintainers uh, and new core contributors. Um, 
And of course, we will acknowledge the new maintainers like Pierre uh, and the new governance in the GitHub repository, but also on the documentation of the framework, um, probably adding a governance page like we have for the data package um, documentation website. And then on the project website, which anyhow is very outdated. Uh, so I went there, we have a people page and um, that page needs basically a review since a very long time. So that's an excellent time to actually add uh, new people in there as well. Um, about the project website, since we're talking about that as well, um, something that Jasper also pointed out, I don't think Jasper is here, but it was also, um, it was also brought up during the Zoom call that we had about the data package documentation is um, trying to find a better way to describe basically the implementations. Um, so currently there is a page called frictionlessdata.io slash universe, so the frictionless universe, um, but it doesn't show much at the moment. I can maybe quickly show you um, what it looks like now. Um, yeah, um, you see my page, right? Yeah, so this is what it looks like now, and I think the ideally what we would like um, it to look like is a place where also you can understand who the main authors or maintainers of each library are so that the, you have an easy way to contact them. Maybe the status, because there are some like the JavaScript library, if I remember correctly, which are kind of like not really maintained at the moment. And then uh, Jasper is also suggesting trying to understand what features are also supported by each library. And then I wanted also to inquire with all of you if there's anything else that you think would make sense in adding as a kind of like um, description of the implementation. You could show the GitHub stars for each of them, uh, which is part of the status, but that's usually a good indication of how active or interesting they could be. That's a very good call. I'm adding it right now. And is there anything else that you think you would find useful in looking at that page? Um, probably downloads or usage, if, if if that's possible. Yeah, I mean, I think you can get downloads from GitHub, so absolutely, I'll add that as well. Let me... so one thing that comes to mind is making clear the differentiation between what's maintained by you know the governance versus community projects. Sorry, Peter, if I, I'm not sure if you raised your hand before or not. Um, and then long term, we could think about even for the community projects, if they're if we actually expect people to be using them, we could try to think about what would be a useful common API. We've talked about this a little bit before, but try to make it so that when people hop from one language to the other, it's consistent, both the API and documentation, perhaps. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Peter, you also have your hand raised. Yeah, I'm thinking about how to keep this page updated. Um, and I mean, an art or something like our universe that's um, pulls in information and has a list, uh, just posted a, a link in the chat. But this is across different software. And one of the things we could do is for every package, for every repository, make sure there's a citation CFF file in there, which contains standardized metadata about um, the things that we have. And then you could have a script that pulled that information together to display it in tabular form. Um, so it's maintained by the maintainers. It is in a standard, the citation CFF. And then you can build this frictionless universe page uh, from the data that you have. So the stars from GitHub, for example, this is something can change over time. If you have a script that pulls that information in, um, that might be easier to maintain. Yeah, thanks, Peter.
Um, okay, I think that's more or less it about the project website. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to quickly um, recap was also what is pending from the data package V2 update. Um, so, and this again is something that I discussed with Peter more or less a month from a month and a half ago. Um, but basically, um, during the call in June, the one about documentation, we kind of like agreed that uh, we need the kind of like convincing page. I didn't find the proper way to call it, but kind of like a selling point uh, for people that arrive to data package to basically um, for them to quickly understand why they need it. Um, so we have uh, links to, of course, the fair principles, but also maybe to, um, um, you know, criteria that are set by institutions like the, um, um, the National Institute for Health or the European Commission or anything like this. Um, so this could be maybe a way uh, to convince people. Um, so this is something I, yeah, I think we could get started on all together. Um, the one voice re-editing of the documentation is probably something I can get started with um, once we also have that page. And um, actually for 2025, uh, Open Knowledge Foundation has some funding to, uh, to do that, that piece of work. Uh, and then the other thing that we um, was mentioned that would be important is writing a paper describing data package. Um, so again, this is something that uh, I can get started on, uh, but of course I will need all your help on that. Um, I'm not a professional writer of academic papers, so I'll definitely need your input. Um, and then, of course, there's the implementations update for data package version two. So that has to do with the Python framework, but also with R and all the other languages. Um, so I know that Peter here is already working on the R implementation uh, and on the update um, on data package. Um, on our side, uh, at the moment, we're a bit blocked. Um, so we had applied on a continuation of the um, funding by NLNet, but we didn't receive it. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we can cover this. Um, excellent to know, Phil, that you would be interested in contributing to the data package, people. Um, and anyone else who would like to, uh, let me know. But basically, yeah, this is all that I wanted to talk with you about today. And then I know that um, Actually, uh, Kyle and Phil wanted to give an update about the um, categorical data working group. So I'll leave them the floor uh, in a minute, but I just wanted to see um, if there's anything else that anyone here wanted to bring up. Yes, Evgeny. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe I'll just quick update on uh, the uh, data repositories part. So um, we, as a part of the you know, that grant, we worked on the um, CK and Zenodo satellite integrations. And uh, um, I think uh, we got a good, good news thanks to the our friends from University of California. So I think the pull request to the Zenodo like software uh, system is uh, getting start to be like in progress. So they transferred and it seems to be they are willing to uh, merge it. So it may be like a good news a little bit like later when it's went through the their like layer at like system. Uh, the data package is uh, appearing soon on uh, Zenodo as well as standard export uh, near to like data site, etc. In the you know like this export box so which will make you know it's a like great adoption thing that it will be like additional two million uh, 10 million like data sets available as a data package so that's additional point to you know to increase work on the implementations because uh, this is the so i prepared the presentation to the uh, university of california team uh, they, they they will be you know uh, going to discuss it with like Zenodo people etc. We uh, didn't like present there, but uh, the point was like for data repositories, data package can be like data API. So there are like different formats, but there are there is like no simple format. Just you know for simple 
information about data structure like files data types etc so uh, it seems to be it like it kind of like worked and uh, um, so just waiting and uh, the second thing that we have a <coughs> as output of uh, NL network we have a CCAN extension in the same thing just a simple data package on from like every data set from the repository which is now kind of like ready but uh, it needs some uh, kind of like uh, pushing into adoption to the second community so maybe when Patricio is back open knowledge can you know facilitate this yeah absolutely thanks Evgeny for bringing that up um Peter I think that you wanted to mention something yeah, three questions about the Zenodo integration. One is, I so I understand that is for something that is deposited on Zenodo, a data package endpoint will be created, which will automatically be populated with metadata, as much of the information they have, and also links to the files. I'm, I'm curious what happens if there is already a data package JSON file deposited in the deposit. Um, the other thing is, is there a possibility if this is getting started to be implemented to test this within this group? Um, and three is, I think it would be very good if there is somebody from Zenodo and somebody from CCAN on the working group of data package that those implementers are represented. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it was my, you know, always my... <laughs> thinking that yeah we need to get you know uh, more people from the industry like presenting sick and presenting but probably like patricio can be uh, can be uh, like representative of sick and of open knowledge all together in the working group because i'm now basically not affiliated to open knowledge regarding data package so and and also we have steve here he's raised his hands so yeah for now um I'm representing Zenodo from the Northwestern team, which is a little bit confusing. We're working on a project called Gray, um, funded through NIH. Um, that's how we do a lot of our work of this implementation. But we have, uh, this is backed up by the developers at uh, CDL, California Digital Library. Um, so the, it's very preliminary. Um, we just, uh, my director, John, just presented um, some of the slides are provided by um, Sarah and her colleagues on data and New Guinea um, on data packages, and it went quite well. And uh, so the um, it's actually more than just Zenodo that we're interested in it, but that's where the work starts. But we can al already say that we have um, introduced the concept as it's implemented by um, by the frictionless group. Um, to Figshare, uh, Mendeley, oh gosh, uh, Dataverse, um, and Bivly, and a few others. So these are generalist repositories. They take a lot of data in, and I think that the implementation that we're looking at um, would be pretty much the same between all of them, but starting with Zenodo. Um, as to if there's an existing uh, JSON, we haven't gotten to that quite yet. Um, but we would love to have um, expert opinions and input from this group. I think that'll be critical to successful implementation. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so, so what I wanted to add that uh, currently uh, the Zen uh, which they answered to, doesn't include uh, handling like data package was deposited to the uh, repository in, and I think it doesn't have uh, table schema type support yet, like no call information, etc. So just started from the uh, smallest list integration, like um, basically uh, the node already exports uh, kind of like metadata in their format, and uh, it's like a data package, uh, the same information as a data package standardized to that package. And then I hope you you know get closer to their maintainers uh, to, to the uh, Steve's team etc. And we can expand uh, because uh, my in, in our presentation it was like yeah the second point was so 
there is a automated data package population as data API, but if a data publisher put data packages on manually, it should be uh, overriding the default, the system default. Uh, Phil, I saw that you write something, but if you want to um, just say something more. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I have much to add to what Steve said before. Um, uh, although I do think that there's some, some area of overlap. Uh, the, the, the two things that I kind of wanted to point out here, um, one of them was um, getting the repositories, because I've worked with about two different uh, or two dozen rather different repositories, um, the generalist ones that Steve was talking about, but also some specific ones. And we begun to develop some tooling for the specific ones that use frictionless as part of the submission sort of protocol. So for example, there's one that NIMH National Institute of Mental Health does called the, the National Institute of Mental Health Data Archive. Um, and, uh, and we've helped a number of people put together sort of frictionless pipelines that work with frictionless data packages to generate submissions for those repositories. So I think the more we link into those repositories, um, that's really going to drive adoption of, of sort of data package. The other thing I was just going to say um, is there are a couple of, of NOCES or sorry, a, a notice of special interest by NIH right now on, um, on sort of enhancing efforts toward data sharing. Um, and um, I, I'm sort of thinking of submitting a couple proposals under that, but anybody who might be interested in participating in that, if, if they want to just hit me up on Slack, um, I, I, a couple of them I think would be very amenable. And I just have not seen people, um, I have not seen people linking together other than like, for example, what Steve just mentioned, but but I I have not seen people linking the fair principles directly to sort of uh, data packaging, at least not as much as as could be done, I think, profitably. So um. yeah, and uh, I think regarding to data repositories, basically everything that data package does can like contribute to the system. It's basically fair itself, like every every like letter, that the package can help with. Uh... Sir, it looks like, you know, there may be something akin to critical mass here that we may want to spin up a working group um, so that we're not in this meeting, we're not, you know, consuming the agenda one, but two, that we could start to focus on um, aspects of both adoption and technical implementation. Um, where we would bring in um, some of the developers of of Dryad, um, Zenodo, and um, Dataverse were all at this meeting last week, um, this NIH meeting, and they're quite interested in the concept of of data packages. And as Phil said, how it directly links to to fair. So there's just sort of this knock on effect of of adoption if you. You know, the teaser is data packages and that's technically appealing and people see the value right away without mentioning fair, but you're sort of, uh, you know, sugarcoating the, the fair principles. And from there, you can lead into vocabulary, standardization, parameter names and every other aspect that makes it easy for data to be interoperable. But I think if we start with data packages and, and can crack the ice with that on multiple fronts, I think that would be an enormous win. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Phil, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just, just one, I totally agree. Just one thing I would add too um, is that um, there's it, it one thing to get kind of people who work in this area of data sharing excited about this, and that's fairly easy to do. But if you think about sort of end, end user, in other words, actual researcher, secondary data users, um, I think that there's still an extent to which, um, well, there's there's a lot that we could do to demonstrate 
how valuable to their actual work, even just the things they care about, which is how quickly can they get up and running with a new data set? How quickly can they harmonize? So for example, um, you know, the idea that you could take a data package and pull it into something like Stata and have all of the variable level metadata present, have tables that relate to each other already pre-linked. I mean, that's just, that's absolutely huge. Or if you're looking to do a meta analysis across a couple of different data sets and you pull them in as data packages and you actually can validate so that you can immediately see, okay, these things are harmonized. These are where I have to do a little bit more work. That can actually, even if you don't care about data sharing, you don't care about data packaging, but you just want to get some secondary data analysis done, we need to show people how much this can move that forward and how 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 much efficiency and so forth it can add. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Kyle, you wanted to add something to that, and then Steve, you. Yeah, just just piggyback piggybacking off that. I'm I'm slated to do a presentation for a um, uh, education and social science data sharing group um, this coming December. Um, and what you're describing is exactly the presentation that I want to give. Um, I think the challenge is that we're not we're, we're not completely there yet. So I'm I'm going to be sort of prefacing the the presentation by like like th this this is where we're we're heading. But you know we I think that there's a lot of software infrastructure that still needs to be developed before um, I can really hand that off to the end users. Like this, it, it's um, so there there's it, the, the, I'm I'm totally with you on the vision um, there, but uh, I, I think we need some we we need to figure out what's our minimum viable product that we can get into the hands of the the data managers and researchers in order for them to um, get sold on that. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Um, Steve and then Keith. Yeah. I, um... Thanks, uh, Kyle. I think that that's that's very true. I mean, it can be a little cart before the horse, but I think that there's another thing to get the work supported is to sell the concept. And I think you can sell the concept um, at places like Hackathon. Um, I have a Hackathon coming up, and if we focus on data packages for, especially for um, when you do interdisciplinary work, then data packages become invaluable. Um, especially for people that are completely unfamiliar, if you take people that are working on, um, you know, community health effects of climate change, um, and you have data packages that go into that analysis, and you pick, or just out in sort of in the wild, picking up things with formats that are not well described and incomplete metadata, um, it becomes apparent to funders right away. And I think we can build the infrastructure. Well, let me let me back up. It'll be very. It'll be much more difficult to build the infrastructure without getting the resources. After selling the concept, and I think that you sort of can preview the future in some selected venues. I have a a, a lecture coming up um, at uh, in Mexico City in a couple of weeks where I'm going to introduce this concept. But every time people see it, and this has been my experience um, as a relatively new adopter, is that their eyes light up and they can make the mental connection between fair with something that's tangible. Thanks, Steve. Um, Keith. Hey, just adding to the same idea of selling points, uh, one more complimentary thing that I've, I've mentioned before, and I'm sure I'll mention again, which is if we work towards something like Conda for data, where people can host one or more repositories, and then you could have a CLI client or where you basically query these repos, find a data set that you're interested in. There might be multiple versions, different processings of it. And then you just do a simple command, pull the data and you can do it. And then if there's dependencies, like if you have a data set that depends on metadata, like a US states file or some other thing, it could figure all that out and pull everything for you. That would be huge. It's something that technically is doable today, but no one's done it. And we would be well positioned, I think, to start to approach that. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, indeed. That's super interesting. We need to find and sort of like understand how we can allocate resources to that. But that would not be impossible indeed. Um, Peter, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I mean, there's, of course, everything that could be built in the future. And I mean, those 
that thinking is really good, but it's also, I think, important to not undersell what's already there. Because I've seen lots of alternatives for data package within communities that are developed, certain data formats and structures and research crates being one of them. And very often there's a spec and that's where it ends. And if we present data packets as just that, then it's not different than anything of the other thing. So with the alternatives, I see two things that I think where data package has an advantage. That is that the scope is very often limited for the alternative. It's like only research data, only that type of data, while data packages are very general and can be built upon. And the other thing is that there's no software yet that implements any of these. It's all, um, how do you call it, vaporware, uh, things that might be there at some points. And yeah, I think with friction is what attracts me is that it's been around for quite a long time and people have implemented it in very, very different ways. And it's it's general too. So yeah, it, it solves a lot of problems already. And it, it, it's very easy to be within a community and think, well, yeah, we're not there yet. While from people outside the community, it's like, oh, okay, there's a lot there already. And that's what we need to sell. That's very true. That's what needs to go on the first page. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> um, Keith, I don't know if your hand was raised from before or if you had something else, otherwise, Kyle. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm 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 totally in agreement that um uh the 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 selling comes first um and and we should we should be, you know be selling till the cows come come home here and so I'm I'm totally on that boat. My my point is simply that like for for this audience that I'm presenting to, they're they're not as they're they're not as technically inclined, so they're not Python users, so they can't use the the whole validation there. Um, it, it's somewhat of a of a puzzle. Um, how, how do I put it? It's somewhat, somewhat of a puzzle to to figure out for different groups what are what are this what do we have right now that they can start using and get them using that. Um, I think that that that's part of what I want to address and figure out. Okay, if if they can't start using it right now, what are the small barriers that we need to address in order to get it so they start using it now? Um, because part of what I'm seeing in a lot of the groups that I'm talking to is that they're tired from from hearing about all of these other efforts that are promising all kinds of things and never deliver any software, right? And so th when I talk to them, they I, I can see them almost turning off because they think I'm I'm another one of those. And so the 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 more we can find um, we can we can find groups that have these kind of data problems that we can get some small little thing working in their hands um i think i think that's uh that, that's a really big win for us and figuring out if if we can't get something that they can start using in their daily daily management routines um what are the barriers that we need to address in order for them to start using um the stuff that we're building that's a very good point kyle and actually i'm thinking that in december we'll release the version one of the what was once called the frictionless application, so open data editor, which is aimed at a completely different audience, so non-technical audience. It allows them to have a sort of like limited set of frictionless functionalities. And maybe Evgeny can tell you a little bit more about that, but it's mainly like validating data and creating data packages. But it's interesting because we're moving towards a completely new audience, which has no programming skills at all. So I'm just thinking maybe that could also be something interesting to mention in that presentation. If it's, for example, less technical audience, um, I can send you some material. So uh, have I broken the like agenda flow? Because I think uh, someone was going to present, no? Yeah, you didn't break the agenda. You brought up very interesting points. So uh, that's all good. Um, I think that Kyle actually wanted to give us a small update, maybe with Phil, um, about the work that they're doing in the categorical data working group. Yeah, so actually, this is a good kind of um, transition off what we were talking about before. Um, one of those. Um, important things that the the audience that I'm trying to reach with frictionless needs is um, uh, rich categorical data support. Um, uh, right now we have um, 
uh, I guess what we're calling inline um, categoricals in the frictionless 2.0 standard, which is um, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, it allows us to produce uh, data packages that have categorical variables that are um, compatible with statistical software like um, uh, like Stata, SPSS, and and R factors, and Python categoricals, and and stuff like that. Um, however, um, myself, uh, Phil, Albert, and Jan, Albert and Jan uh, couldn't make it here today. We've been discussing um, uh, uh, the uh, a, a, a slightly different approach that would be complementary and extend um, the current inline categoricals. Um, that would uh, we're, we're building it right now in, in the form of a recipe, um, and it allows you to define uh, uh, data resources that are explicitly categorical tables. Um, so these would be uh, a tabular resource that have um, uh, categorical codes and then and labels, but then as well uh, be able to include other um, information, potentially hierarchical information about the categoricals. Um, in addition to um, adding more rich media uh, metadata about the levels, um, it allows you to reuse the categorical uh, uh, code lists that you define across multiple variables, um, which is a, you know again a really important um, uh, functionality in these um, education and social science situations when we're using lots of categorical data. Um, so we've been meeting semi regularly. Um, uh, and I just got a, a question about ordinals, and yes, we have the, that that includes ordinals um, in the categorical data uh, with a uh, uh, ordered flag. Um, so we've been meeting semi regularly, um, and um, if you're uh, interested in being a part of that discussion, um, just reach out to me, and I can add you to our little um, uh, uh, Slack chat uh, group. Um, but I think the the thing we we just wanted to let the group know that this is something that we're working on and almost ready to um, to share with the group to get feedback on. One of the things that came up in our last meeting was the issue of um, uh, different language support. Um, and so I just wanted to quickly sort of ping the group on um, on that. We found that there's a there's a language support recipe um, um, that that's in the uh, that, that's currently in the, the data package standard, um, but we wanted to know what other, I, I think last time I heard about language support, it sounded like there was a number of approaches that have been entertained over the years. And I just wanted to make sure that we were, um, you know, sort of had all of the, we were looking at all of the possibilities at our disposal here. So I was curious in addition to the, um, in addition to the language support recipe, are there other um, ways of doing, um, uh, are there other ways of doing language support that we should be aware of, I guess? Thanks, Kyle. Um, Peter and then Evgeny. I'm just realizing that this aligns very much with what we in our domain call controlled vocabularies, which also have like hierarchies and things that are expressed uh, where you have to use a controlled term and there are standards to express those already. Um, I know that there's different services that provide vocabularies which for every term has an endpoint and there's relationships between those things, uh, exactly ontologies. Um, and those have also ways to uh, support languages. So I think it would be very good to look into the existing systems that are there and if data package can align with that to support categoricals that are linked out to a resource that is there uh, rather than building something from scratch would be very good. I'll try to look up some resources uh, of how things are expressed, um, but then we're building on upon something rather than next to something and like starting from scratch yeah it, it, it's a very big world the ontology controlled for calories evgeny do you want to go ahead uh, um yeah so i think just as we discussed it is uh, augusto a few times uh that uh, 
I think uh, proper like not proper like official language support needs to be like one of the few of next futures uh, we had maybe 2.1 or 2.2 but I hope this year Yeah, I was also thinking about Augusto. Maybe I'll make sure that he's around for, um, I don't know if at some point, Kyle, you would want to present that, uh, but it would be good maybe to have Augusto at that call and I can point you to him in the community chat or you can reach out directly to him um, to see a little bit. Um, I'm sure he would be interested in participating in that and also having him at the call could show us how long his beard has gone. So for those who are not here, like very often, basically August, whenever he comes to this meeting, he has a longer beard. So... <laughs> That's for just the little jokes. Um, but Keith, you wanted to say something about that. Yeah, just kind of following up with the same idea. So this relates to what I've talked about before with this idea of having a separate kind of domain and structure. And so when you start to talk about control vocabulary and ontology, that's where we can start to like bring in this domain and flesh out like what that might look like. And I would love to try to think about it in starting with the most general uh, shared vocabularies at the top, because there are things like units that are useful across many different fields and domains. And we can agree that, you know, regardless of biology or oceanography or, you know, astro, whatever, we're all going to talk about things the same way. Um, space, time, spectral domains are all generally useful. And then from there, we can have, you know, uh, a hierarchy or mix in model where you can incorporate different ontologies where some of this has already been fleshed out. Um, but that we haven't made that formal yet at all. Um, so challenging, but super useful and worth thinking about. Thanks, Keith. Um, Evgen, I don't know if your hand is raised from before or if you want to say something else. I'm not sorry. No worries. <laughs> Okay, so um, unless you have other stuff, Kyle, you wanted to mention something else? Well, just um, if there was any other um, the regarding the language support question, is the 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 language um uh, recipe the the main one that we should be looking at that people are using, or are there other um ways that folks have been um doing internationalization in in their data packages? Um. I think currently the recipe is the main thing, but I personally uh, don't know uh, what it will be like, I think, the official implementation, because uh, I think the idea that Peter also mentioned that it will be good to uh, stick to one of the existing standards like data site or something. So uh, personally, I just am not sure if it's already uh, uh, compatible or not. So I'm just going to you know, wrap my head in the like translations like uh, a little bit later, but if someone knows. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, when it's like officially in the application, we just need to like take it from some existing standard and just uh, use it in the package. So maybe Peter, you can comment. Yeah. Yeah. From what I see in practice rather than in theory, it is that people want to people have their data set in one language and just want to indicate what language that was used rather than um, having multi-language support for a single data set. Um, so yeah, having being able in your metadata to indicate in what language it is. I mean, for example, in Z data site has this this property. Um, so yeah, I don't know how much further we need to go in scope and that for defining our specs, however, there, it could be useful to have translations of the files, but that's quite an undertaking. And I, I think, uh, 
uh, yeah, we have to think carefully if we want to do that because that's a, a big maintenance thing too. There are services where you can ask um, basically crowdsourcing to translate your specs. Um, I think crowding is one to do that. But that could be something for like the longer term roadmap. I know that uh, GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, is using crowd in to translate their documentation. And then, yeah, you basically break down all your documentation and text strings, which you submit. You get a crowdsourced translation back, and then you can build that into your software. Well, that sounds good. I think um, it, it sounds like the the in terms of uh, putting multilingual support into a um, into data package properties, it sounds like the recipe is the way to go. So we'll um, we'll continue um, heading in that direction. Um, also, Peter, to address your answer here in terms of the uh, multiple formats um, uh, to to talk about these hierarchies. Um, like I mentioned, I think a little earlier, SDMX is one of those standards um, that uh, that we've been looking at, and I think there's there's a lot of these um, standards out there that encapsulate these ontologies. So rather than rather than trying to to support all of them, I think we've we've been converging on a um, a, a simple uh, a, a very simple way, like we said, of using. Um, uh, uh, data or ta tabular resources that um, work sort of similar to, to join keys and actually fits really, really nicely um, in terms of how how this would all fit into a database and then create easily joinable um, uh, 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 fields of information onto the categorical variables that you're using um, and can potentially even leverage some of the um, constraint machinery around um, uh, the the foreign keys and and stuff like that. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll be able to show more once we um, have a more final render of that. It seems like every time we meet, we think of more. It's one of those things that seems really simple, but every time we meet, we think of more little pieces there. But we're, we're getting to the end now, so we, we should hopefully have something to to share with the group in the next month or so. So we're we're excited about that. Fantastic, Kyle. What I wanted to propose actually is maybe once this is ready, if you want to like literally present it like in broader sense to the community, let me know. Um, I know that um, for the October call, uh, Keith wanted to present something, but for example, if you wanted to present this in November, uh, we have a spot available, so just let me know. Yeah, Peter. I had a question on the frictionless framework where Pierre is now interested to, to contribute and the ID to make it part of um, BioOpenSci. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I was curious who, who will take a, a decision on that. So for the people who don't know BioOpenSci, it's like our OpenSci, it's an open source community of a collection of maintained packages. It's a community and they offer two things that are very useful um, other than visibility, which is peer review of your software. Um, and the other thing is that if you want to step away as a maintainer, you immediately have a community of other maintainers of packages that might want to help you maintain the package. So I'm active in the R open side one. I know less about the Pi open side one, but yeah, it's definitely, I mean, the frictionless framework can definitely be part of the frictionless community and us and the by open side community as well. It's just um, an, another community or a source to get contributions or maintenance from. Um, and yeah, I think to be part of that community, to have your software there, it needs to go through the peer review process, um, which can only improve the quality of your software. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so since you suggested that, I, I mean, I started looking a little bit in how you can get in your software into uh, the PyOpenSci community. Um, I haven't gone deep into it yet. Um, and I think that we will need to have also discussion with well, Pierre, um, Evgeny, and uh, Patricia as well, the tech lead uh, at Open Knowledge Foundation to see how we move forward and who will kind of like handle that. Uh, but as you say, I think it could be useful, first of all, for the 
overall sustainability of the project, also to get other eyes on the code base. You know, I mean, it's just and it's just great to be part of also another community as well, um, especially one like by open side that does so many amazing things. Also, I don't know the timeline from when you propose something, how long that would take. I have no idea. So, <laughs> so let's see. Yeah, if it's similar to our open side, uh, the peer review is finished within a month. So you get it back fairly. You, you have way more work in preparing your software for peer review because there's guidelines. And for example, your tests need to be, test coverage need to reach a certain... Uh, I'm, I'm exp talking from the R open side mm -hmm. experience. So you need to make sure that your software is uh, developed according good practices. Uh, and then the review process is all through one big GitHub pull request where you get your reviews as comments on the pull request. You need to address those. So it's all open, um, but it's a lot better I find than having a paper about your software because very often people don't look at the software just at the paper. This is about the software itself. Um, yeah, and then you get the community and the maintenance for free. Exactly. So that was a very great idea, Peter. I'm really grateful for that you brought it up. And then for this paper on data package, is this... Um, I saw some people react in the chat who are interested. Sarah, are you planning to then kickstart a small working group on that uh, to start this next year? And then uh, I'll also add it to my planning for next year to make some time available for that, because I think it will have a big impact uh, if, uh, if we can have this. Yeah, absolutely. So the plan would be exactly, I'll, I'll put together a list of all the people that said that were interested and I'll reach out well, either on, on the Slack chat or via email. Uh, maybe I'll start putting some kind of like structure together or something that we can work on. And then maybe we can agree on a way to work also a little bit asynchronous on that. Um, but Phil, I think you wanted to add something. Well, I was just going to say, um, we might want to consider writing that paper in two versions. Um, one that is shorter and a little more accessible and one that is, you know, just just because I could imagine publishing those two in different places and thereby really increasing the likelihood that people will see it. And it can be more efficient if we know that's what we're going to do to do those together rather than to do one and then decide, oh, we need the other and then do that, you know, separately. So I just, I, th I think that I, I could see, um, one of the things, a push-pull between something that was really quite accessible versus something that had some more technical meat in it. And um, and I think trying to wrap that into one big giant paper would make the whole thing harder to publish and a little less accessible than if we just had two, you know, slightly different versions. Very good point, Phil. And yeah, absolutely, Peter, I think that could also be, maybe the shoulder version could be the intro to the data package website. I'm, by the way, planning to take a lot of inspiration from the Camera Trap DP paper, so just that mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> okay, so unless... Anyone has any last question that they could ask in one minute or any last comment? No? Um, I just wanted to say, so the next community call is going to be on Halloween, so the 31st of October. Um, so Keith is going to present something, I hope spooky a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, then Kyle, if ever you want to present in November, just let me know. Um, Yes, other than that, thanks everyone uh, for joining today. Um, I'll put all of this into a blog post with hopefully a couple of action points and then I'll reach out to all of you to whom I promise something um, separately. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day and see you next month. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care.